Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this very special event to launch Dr. Bren Khalil's insightful exploration of the challenges to achieving peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands across Australia where each of us is located and by paying my respect to their history, their rich culture and unique ongoing contribution to this nation. I'd also like to acknowledge our special guest this evening, Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus and the Vice President of the Inst Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, Dr. Iran Lerman. We are also delighted to have join us tonight, Senator James Patterson, Josh Burns, the member for McNamara, Senator Eric, Erica Betts and Senator Raf Shikoni. Thank you all for joining us. Now, before introducing the shadow attorney to officially launch the book, I wanted to say a few words about Brent. His long held interest in Israel and deep understanding of the complex obstacles to peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Brent first visited Israel 30 years ago at the age of 14. That gives something away. He traveled with his parents, both of whom were and are committed Christian Zionists. While Brent isn't Jewish, his affinity with Israel has only intensified since that time. He returned in 1997 to volunteer on a kibbutz and ended up living at the kibbutz for more than two years. When the second intifada began in 2000, Brent was a university student in Adelaide, but experienced an irresistible pull to return to Israel. His reasons, he says, were simple. People were staying away and the media's perspective was unrelentingly anti-Israel. Now, Bren was determined to demonstrate to his peers that the simplistic messages that they read and viewed in the media were misguided. He did the third year of his bachelor's degree at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and returned the following year on a Yahad scholarship to write his honors thesis, which focused on the implementation of peace agreements. Now, it goes without saying that Jeanette Searle, ZFA CEO and I, we were pretty chuffed to recruit Bren as our Director of Public Affairs in 2019. And while his knowledge and capacity were a given, the qualities that he's brought to the role and the ZFA more broadly goes well beyond that. It's rare in life to meet and work with a person as thoughtful as Bren, as committed to live and work according to their values. And I'm constantly struck by how Bren is able to navigate complex delicate issues to understand and respect alternative perspectives while staying true to himself. In one sense, Bren's book, The Challenges of Resolving the Israeli-Palestinian Dispute, might seem pessimistic, but in reality, its central message is positive. Peace is possible, and to achieve it, we need to be clear-eyed and patient, and we need to cast off people on either side who undermine peace. The signposts on how to go about it are all in the book. The book's key value, I believe, is its contribution to the public discussion. It helps us understand the parties to the conflict and in turn, helps us make sense of it. As Bren acknowledges in the book, his thesis on the conflict is not a design to convince people to support one side or the other side. It won't change people's minds, but what it is designed to do and what it does do is to create more nuance. And greater nuance is what's needed for governments, be they Israeli, Palestinian, or foreign, to make policies around the conflict that are more likely to make a positive difference. And so it's now my great pleasure to introduce the federal member for Isaacs and Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus. Mark is well known to us all and is a long-standing supporter of Israel and the Jewish community. Mark, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. And uh, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I can say how pleased I am to be joined by a number of parliamentary colleagues, uh, including uh, the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, Senator Patterson, uh, one of our colleagues on the committee, Senator Abetz, and two of my Labor colleagues, uh, Senator Ciccone and Josh Burns, the member for McNamara. Um, it's a pleasure to be participating in an event like this. Um, the launch of Bren Khalil's book, uh, 
titled The Challenges of Resolving the Israeli-Palestinian Dispute, An Impossible Peace. Uh, and before I'd start, I start, it's a pleasure to be participating in an event, even if it is still via Zoom, because it somehow feels as though normal life is uh, on the verge of recommencing here in, in Melbourne and de indeed throughout Australia after the living so long under the constraints of the pandemic. I've known Bren for many years, since before I joined the parliament, uh, when I was serving as a member of the editorial board, the AJAC editorial board, and Bren joined the staff. Um, but I've had a number of engagements with Bren in the various positions that he has held uh, since then, uh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, most recently, uh, I've again engaged with Bren uh, through his involvement in two recent inquiries uh, conducted by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Um, and perhaps I can, I've got witnesses here tonight, my parliamentary colleagues, I can reassure those of you who don't know about the work of the Intelligence Committee that despite the generally rancorous divisions of our national parliament, split as we are often along increasingly partisan party lines, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security is almost always able to function free of those partisan considerations as a genuinely bipartisan committee. And given the gravity of the subject matter that the Intelligence Committee is dealing with, uh, including, of course, the threat of terrorism. That's a very good thing for our country. This year, the Intelligence Committee has, among many other tasks, inquired into the appropriateness of the Australian government listing the whole of the Hamas organisation and the whole of the Hezbollah organisation as terrorist organisations. Bren provided insightful and persuasive evidence to the committee in both those inquiries and assisted in making sure that a very full picture was put before the committee. And I think I, I, it's fair to say in the presence of my colleagues that I can attribute uh, the conclusions that I and my colleagues reached, uh, which were firm recommendations to the government of Australia that both those organisations should be listed in their entirety is due in no small part to the efforts that Bren uh, put into those inquiries. I, I should return, however, to, to Bren's book, The Challenges of Resolving the Israeli-Palestinian Dispute. And I think its surtitle, uh, An Impossible Peace, reflects a sentiment or at least a question that many of us who've watched the convulsions of that conflict through our entire lives sometimes feel. Uh, we all know there's an astonishing number of books on the history, conduct and ongoing challenges of resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. Many foreign correspondents on returning from a posting in the Middle East add to that number with their own book of reflection, one of the more insightful of which I've always felt is Thomas Friedman's From Beirut to Jerusalem, it's a favourite of mine. It, it, it seems it's rare for a month to pass without another book on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict being published, whether it's by a retired foreign minister or engaged in negotiations, or a diplomat or a military commander, or the legions of academics who write in this field. But while there is a great deal written on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it seems to me that there are always new things to say and new ways to understand why the conflict appears so intractable. What Bren has done with this book is to offer a new way of understanding the conflict. And based on this understanding, Bren has, I think, identified approaches that may be more effective in fostering a just and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, Jeremy briefly touched on Bren's central argument, which is that what we think of as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is actually made up of multiple conflicts and that each of these conflicts falls into one of two categories, either territorial or existential. Specifically, the book identifies territorial conflicts as those fought over land and consequently through either sharing or dividing the land, Bren asserts that conflict resolution is possible. He uses Fatah 
and Hamas as exemplars of the two approaches on the Palestinian side. Fatah is officially committed to establishing a Palestinian state next to Israel, whereas Hamas is committed to establishing a Palestinian state instead of Israel. And in Bryn's dichotomy, Fatah is fighting a territorial conflict with Israel, whereas Hamas is fighting an existential conflict. If you are a territorialist, but you perceive your enemy as an existentialist, then the policy choices that you make in regards to the conflict will be different than if you perceive your enemy as a territorialist. After all, it is possible to negotiate a peace with a territorialist. So ideally, you make choices that show that you're willing to compromise in order to achieve a just and lasting peace on terms acceptable to both peoples. For instance, Israel could remove checkpoints to ease movement for Palestinians. And indeed, when there is less tension, there are always fewer checkpoints. But what are the checkpoints for? Bren explains that ultimately they are to prevent existentialist Palestinians who have no interest in compromise and accommodation from killing Israelis. So in regard to the checkpoints, we see an Israeli policy, which is designed to stop existentialist Palestinians, also hurt territorialist Palestinians because it impedes their movement. The checkpoints also make territorialist Palestinians think that Israel is not interested in peace and undermines their willingness to make peace with Israel. On the other side of the coin, if Israel were to remove the checkpoint so as to improve life for Palestinians, it would also make it easier for existentialist Palestinians to kill Israelis. So that's an example of the heart of the problem. There are territorialists and existentialists on both sides. The complexities caused by the interplay of territorialists and existentialists on the same side and on both sides is a thread that runs through this book. In concluding his book, Bren lays down a challenge to territorialists everywhere, Israelis, Palestinians, and foreign governments, including Australia. The challenge is this. Once the territorial existential dichotomy is understood, he calls on us to choose policies that build up the legitimacy of territorialists and that undermine the legitimacy of existentialists. Both Israeli and Palestinian territorialists have allowed existentialists within their midst to get away with behaviour that undermines the chance of peace. They've allowed this behaviour because challenging those within a society who claim to champion the nation's interests, even though their agenda entails an existentialist projection of the opponent's legitimacy and hence of a lasting peace, is politically fraught. The tragic murder of Yitzhak Rabin, one of Israel's greatest heroes and leaders by an Israeli existentialist painfully illustrates this point. And by allowing the existentialists to claim they represent the national interest and allowing them to pursue policies framed by that uncompromising agenda, Bren argues that the message that the other side receives is that their opponent is not interested in the territorial compromises that are essential to peace. In this way, the peace process is continually undermined as the position of the territorialists on both sides of the conflict is undermined by that uncompromising position of the existentialists. That's a lot to absorb on a Sunday evening, I appreciate, and I'm certain I have not done Bren's detailed analysis justice, but there's my take on what this book is about. I would encourage all of you to buy and read Bren's book and to reflect on the arguments that he presents. I found it uh, absorbing and I'm looking forward to the discussion which is to follow now uh, between Bren and Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, and also thank you, Jeremy, um, before uh, your, um, your, your thoughts, your, your comments about, about me, about my book, um, they, really, they really mean a lot to me, um, so, so thank you. I am about to introduce Iran. Um, before I do so, however, however I thought I might uh, spend maybe five minutes just talking about, um, about my book, about how it came to be, and then one or two of the concepts behind it. 
it, it really started uh, in a conversation in Jerusalem uh, 15 or even uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was having a conversation uh, trying to make sense of the second intifada. And the words existential conflict came into the conversation. And those words really struck me and they stay with me for, for weeks, years, because without doubt, um, some people, some Palestinians will never be satisfied for as long as Israel continues to exist. So Israel, like it or not, is fighting an existential conflict with these people. However, that's not true of all of Israel's enemies, because without doubt, there are some Palestinians who, let's face it, they're never going to be Zionists, but, but they will be satisfied to live in a Palestinian state alongside Israel. So they're not fighting an existential conflict with Israel. They're fighting what I came to call a territorial conflict. So when I sort of stumbled across this, this idea of, the, of this territorial existential dichotomy, it really opened up to me so many elements of, of, of the conflict. Well, first of all, it's not a conflict. As Mark said, it's conflicts, because if you've got some people fighting a territorial conflict and other people fighting an existential conflict, then it's clear that you've got more than one conflict happening. And of course, it's not all about the Palestinians, because on the Israeli side, there are also territorialists and existentialists. That's why I've taken to calling that the Israeli-Palestinian dispute rather than Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But really, um, one of the key insights which Mark touched upon um, when one looks at the dispute through the prism of the dichotomy is all about perception. Because if you perceive that your enemy is fighting an existential conflict against you, then your actions and reactions vis-a-vis -vis that conflict will be considerably different than if you perceive that your enemy is actually a territorialist. Because remember, an existentialist will not compromise with you. They will not rest until you have been destroyed. Whereas a territorialist one day might be involved in a peace process with you. With mutual compromise, there might one day be peace. So you can see how one's perceptions of oneself and one's enemies can change the conflict dynamic. And in the book, I go through the history of the dispute and show how um, perceptions of the enemy has changed over time. Um, but it's not just about Israelis and Palestinians, because of course, how foreigners perceive the conflict also shapes things. And it, also, and it explains why the West gets the Israeli-Palestinian dispute wrong every single time because the west views the dispute as a territorial conflict to a certain extent we can't really blame the west for this because almost all violent conflicts in the world are actually territorialist conflicts existential conflicts are relatively few and far between and we in the west don't fight existential conflicts anymore and so we assume that a conflict in front of us is territorialist as a territorial conflict and so therefore um we make that mistake but what we will do is we will judge all the actions of all the Israelis and all the Palestinians through that prism of them being territorialists, which is why that we in the West frequently come up with wrong policy prescriptions of what's to do, but it's because of course, um, they're not all territorialists. Um, because as Mark said, you can resolve a territorial conflict. The way you resolve it is by sharing or dividing the land, but you can't resolve an existential conflict. They have to be won or at the very least managed. And if you try and have a peace process to resolve a territorial conflict, when the existential conflicts are ongoing, what you'll find is that those existentialists will undermine the peace process every single time, which is what Yigal Amir did uh, in regards to killing Yisak Rabin, but of course, it also the reason why in the seven years of the Oslo peace process, more Israelis died as a result of terrorism than in any other preceding seven year period. So the West, so, so understanding that the dispute contains both territorials and existentialists, I think is, the, is really my key goal of this book. If I can make people make make um, people involved in policy realize this. And as Mark said, they're not necessarily going to be suddenly pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, but I think they'll have a greater chance to understand the dispute better and come to the dispute with, um, with a bit more nuance. So on 
In that regard, I'd like to introduce Iran Lerman. Now, Iran is the vice president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, which is an Israeli think tank. It's involved heavily in the national security sphere. And if your interest is national security issues, then I strongly encourage you to sign up to their mailing list because their output is really good. Uh, before that, Iran was the deputy national security advisor of Israel. But I actually met Iran before he was in that position. I was in Israel with an AJAC tour, uh, taking some journalists there. And we, uh, we received a briefing from Iran, and that briefing was, was entertaining, it was clarifying, it was nuanced, it was far and away the best briefing we got for the entire week. And so, of course, I um, started looking for Iran's um, public works after that, and of course saw the, um, saw the announcement that he'd been um, appointed the Deputy National Security Advisor, and of course he disappeared from public view. But when he left that position and has re-entered public life, um, I've enjoyed reading his analyses um, since that time. I sent him an early copy of my book and he was good enough not only to read it, but to, to say that he thought it was all right. And, uh, and he offered one or, two, um, one or two comments that improved the book. So for all of those reasons, I'm absolutely thrilled that Iran can be here tonight um, to have a conversation about, uh, about the book and about the conflict it is about. Iran, welcome. And thank you for the introduction. By the way, I should mention that I'm also now the editor-in-chief uh, of a, an independent magazine, not directly related to the Jerusalem Institute, called the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. And the fascinating aspect of it is that uh, our publisher is actually a friend of Israel who is a Moroccan Muslim. And I urge you all to visit the, uh, the website, uh, www.jstribune.com. Soon enough, we'll have a piece by one of our participants there today, uh, Paul, Paul Monk. And, um, and also, I'm, I'm very grateful to be in the company of Australians again. I always start every conversation, particularly in November, by mentioning any November, by mentioning the debt that we can never ever repay, not only for Beersheba, which people tend to remember the charge of the Light Brigade, but also for Australians uh, with great trepidation, uh, keeping a division alongside the New Zealanders in Egypt in 42 for the decisive battle that took place 79 years ago and saved all of us from being existentially wiped out. Uh, by Rommel, and by the way, by his Palestinian uh, collaborators who were sent, uh, dispatched by Haj Amil Husseini to help plan the extermination of the Jews of the land of Israel had the, the Nazis actually won, but they didn't. And it was about uh, this time of year when the breakthrough came uh, decisively and, and uh, changed not only the course of the war, but also our fate here in this country which is a good reminder that uh, Brent's dichotomy or Brent's uh, tools of analysis, which I think are, um, to, to anyone who's been dealing with the conflict uh, for as long as I have, they came as a very refreshing um, clarification of things that we all sort of vaguely understood or generally felt but to be given, uh, you know, it's like a Columbus egg to be to actually for these for these the definitions to be put in clear and and well organized language was, I think, a serious contribution uh, to the discussion, and I'm grateful for that. But what I was about to say is that it goes back, and I think uh, uh, we've discussed it uh, uh, while uh, I was commenting on on Brent's draw. Um, way back into the 1930s, because the first major territorial proposition as a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict came from the British government in 1937. And interestingly enough, there were ter territorialists and existentialists on the Israeli side, way, or, or the Zionist side, already then, and Ben-Gurion, with great uh, heartburn and, and, and difficulty uh, signed on to the uh, Peel Commission uh, proposal. And I found uh, in my own research over uh, years ago that uh, there were quite a number of Palestinian territorialists back then 
who thought that the peel offer, which gave uh, much of the land to the Palestinians, was actually uh, an acceptable proposition, even if it would have involved a transfer of populations or exchange of populations in the north and, and a few other problematic measures. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there was a significant faction uh, known as the opposition, Al Mu'arada, in the on the Palestinian side. They thought that uh, yes, we we maybe that's the way out. Why do you think? However, yeah, yes. Go on. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, why do you think um, they weren't successful? I mean, what sort of... Um, well, uh, what, what, uh, what happened was that uh, the predominant group, they, they were the opposition. Uh, they came from the uh, social elite of Jerusalem and from the focal uh, points of several other areas in the country. In the country. But the predominant faction uh, was led by Haj Amin Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. And unfortunately, the British government, uh, an act of folly in the early 20s, gave this virulent man uh, the uh, position of coordinating uh, the Muslim council, but also the, the status of the ultimate uh, religious authority, the mufti, the man who issues uh, uh, religious injunctions, fatwas, to the Muslim community. And uh, help establish him as the predominant leader. And he had violent, uh, a violent base of support, which turned not only on the, against the Jews and the British in 1936, they also uh, used violence, murderous violence, to suppress and break the opposition groups. And uh, soon enough, what came to be called the Great Arab Rebellion of the 1930s, which is a seminal event in the history of the Palestinian uh, move, national movement in, in, in the history of the conflict, uh, degenerated into, uh, into Nissan, it, into murderous Palestinian on Palestinian violence. Uh, people died in the hundreds and thousands. And uh, he came up the victor, unfortunately. Uh, had, had it been otherwise, the uh, history of the entire conflict may have been different. Our own history may have been different in a profound way. Imagine there would have been a Jewish state established with Palestinian consent in 30, 1938, and there would have been a harbor in Haifa and a harbor in Tel Aviv under Jewish sovereignty, able to take the people of Europe, Jewish people of Europe who understood, who began to understand the, the, the monstrosity of what was coming upon them. So um, I hold the Muft Haj Amin Husseini uh, responsible not only for what happened to us, but also what happened to the Palestinians, the, the profound tragedy of both peoples, you know, going so back to the rejection of territorialist solutions uh, already in the 1930s. It's interesting what um, the Palestinian faction you were saying, um, it strikes me that you know they were they were pragmatic and, and they were basically they were uh, um, they, they were driven by pragmatism. In the book, I, I don't actually talk about that because I have to admit I, I wasn't really across it. But on the Israeli side, um, I think I think the the original Zionist concept was very much you'd, you'd imagine it would be existentialist because they had no um, really conception uh, to begin with that that Palestinians would. Um, would be bothered by the creation of a Jewish state. They, they, they thought the Palestinians would welcome a Jewish state, but then I think as they, as they became aware of Palestinian objections, then, um, then more and more the pragmatists in the Israeli side um, started, started accepting the need that they're gonna actually have to divide the land. And I think the, um, it's interesting that, that basically that, that distinction between the ideologues, which were really encompassed by the revisionist Zionists, and then the, the pragmatists, which in this, in this sense at least were encompassed by the, um, by the labor Zionists. Um, no, there were labor Zionists who were existentialists too. Well, uh, that, uh, and, and like the, now, the labor, uh, the Achdut HaAvodah, Tabenkin and his men mm -hmm. uh, were opposed to partition. Mm -hmm. But Ben-Gurion came, you know, he actually wrote indirectly to Truman, he wrote to Felix Frankfurter, 1946. He didn't actually inform everyone uh, in his own movement. There were very few people who knew what he was about to do. And he suggested partition. 
he envisioned a partition between Judea, the name Israel wasn't there yet, and Abdaliah, that's to say King Abdallah's domain in, uh, in Transjordan, which would also become sovereign in, uh, in what we nowadays more or less call the West Bank. The lines he drew were not very different from the lines of, uh, of a possible comprom compromise today. Mm. So uh, there's a long, um, let's say, lineage uh, to the territorialist compromise uh, pre predating uh, the actual establishment of the state. I think that Truman would probably not have been as supportive as he was of a Jewish statehood had he not been aware that Ben-Gurion is a territorialist in, in, in Brent's uh, uh, classification. Tell me, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the Alphalina affair. Uh, for those listening to, who are unaware of it, it was where basically it was early on in um, in the War of Independence. Israel, I think, had just declared independence, um, and existentialists were trying to bring weapons in for their own armies. And the territorialist Israeli government said, "Look, you need to, you know, you need to give us those weapons. They're all now part of the Israeli army." And there was a gunfight, and the territorialists won that gunfight, um, and the existentialists lost. It's interesting that you're talking about that. The, the, the Great Arab Revolt of 1936, where um, um, Hosseini won that battle, um, and so to speak, because I remember Rabin once told, I think, Dennis Ross, it was in Dennis Ross's book, Dennis Ross is an American negotiator, um, the Palestinians need to have the Altalena affair. Now, mm -hmm. if you know, it, it feels, and I, I, as I wrote in the book, well, Rabin commanded the, well, the unit commanded that actually that. fired the gun yeah. that sunk, that sank that, uh, that ship. It is a tragedy. It, uh, there are people on the uh, revisionist side who say it could have been settled without the violence. Um, that's a debatable proposition. But clearly for Ben-Gurion, there must, there was, it was clear that there will be one authority and one capacity to make decisions uh, uh, enshrined in the national institutions of the state. Mm. Uh, interestingly, among the inheritors of the Jabotinsky position, the Likud party today, um, it's easy to, to paint them, and the Palestinians regularly paint them as existentialists, but if you look at, uh, at Prime Minister Netanyahu's actual positions in government, um, let's say I would even risk uh, saying, look at his indirect authorship or, or, or parenthood of the Trump plan. The Trump plan is a territorialist suggestion. It is not an existentialist. It accepts the prospect of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. May not, it may not be in the borders that Palestinians imagine they were, uh, in, in, in their own minds, but it is a territorialist proposition. And it was very clearly engineered in close consultation with Netanyahu and with his right man ambassador Ron Derma in Washington. So the, the uh, territorialism, as Bren uh, properly points out, uh, is not the exclusive domain of the Israeli left. It is uh, deeply ingrained also in the center right, not in the hard, hard right uh, that is represented today in the Knesset in the hardline opposition, uh, of, uh, of the Jewish home, or, or the uh, no, what they call nowadays the uh, uh, Zionist uh, religious party. But um, uh, this is a small minority of Israelis nowadays. Well, look, There's um, a broad base for territorialism of some kind, not necessarily the kind the Palestinians envision. I would call it simply a willingness to see a Palestinian state, but not on Palestinian terms. However, Bren also draws an interesting distinction within the territorialist camp, and I think it's a useful one, between those who want to give the Palestinians and see if what we can get in, uh, in return, and those who insist that the Palestinians come clear on their territorialist uh, position. And here is the important, here in, into this comes the importance of a point that uh, the previous government raised, the, pre the present government of Israel doesn't raise any issue because it's so deeply internally torn uh, 
that it is not going to deal with this. It's going to uh, do conflict management until we hear something very dramatic from the Palestinians. The previous government took the position that in order for us to make the sacrifices that would be expected of us in a permanent status agreement, the Palestinians need to talk clearly, unambiguously about the recognition of, well, I think the prime minister called it a Jewish Israel as a Jewish state. I don't like that shorthand because it is open to all kinds of interpretations. I would go for a slightly longer in today's uh, world of uh, sound bites. It's a bit a longer and more complicated way of putting it, but I think it needs to be there because it's more accurate. We need them to understand and accept that Israel is the embodiment of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination. Now, the answer we get from some serious Palestinians, and I've, I've been getting it uh, in direct conversations over the years, is, well, you know, the Jews are not a people. Judaism is a religion, uh, which uh, the second half is true. Judaism is a religion, but it is a religion of a people. Uh, even our calendar uh, speaks to our territorial uh, peoplehood because we fix it in order for our holidays to remain geared to the uh, climatic cycle in Israel. If you know how the Jewish calendar, which is Luna, is calculated uh, with, with seven extra months over 19 years to remain in gear with the solar year uh, because otherwise we would lose touch with our agriculturally based uh, holidays, which are related to the Jewish people being a people of a land. What, and this um, is the point uh, we are trying to make to our Palestinian potential partners. You need for us to be comfortable that this is indeed a territorial compromise. You need to come clean on your understanding that the Jews are a people and uh, the, the Zionist movement, whether you like it or not, was the embodiment of self-determination. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe, um, what I've argued in the book is that the, as Mark um, earlier uh, intimated, that Fatah is officially a territorialist party and the Hamas is an existential party. If Hamas wants Israel to be wiped off the map, Fatah is willing to negotiate. Um, I basically argue that, that Fatak is, is grudgingly territorialist. They haven't, as you said, they haven't reconciled themselves to the, to, to the Jewish right to self-determination. They're not Zionists, but the Fatak leadership have basically realized that Israel's not going anywhere. Um, and therefore um, the pragmatic uh, among them are basically saying, look, we need to negotiate with Israel in order to create a Palestinian state because we can't keep fighting Israel because we keep on losing. It's interesting that 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 Palestinian journey has followed the Arab journey. It might be, you know, 10, 20 years behind the Arab journey because of course 1948, all the Arab states were very much existentialists that wanted to wipe Israel off the map. And then in a process that, you know, begun, really begun in 67 and, and, and hit pitch at 73, um, the Arab states realized that they can't destroy Israel and they, they eventually gave up trying and, and arguably the 2002 Saudi initiative, uh, the Saudi peace plan idea was, was the culmination, was the official sort of announcement that the Arab states, the majority of the Arab states had become territorialists. And, and now if you look, I mean, now, you know, with Morocco, with Bahrain, with the UAE, with Sudan, but particularly with, with, with the UAE, not only are they willing to sign that, rumors they're about they're Libya, you know, they're this morning. celebrating that they are embracing Israelis, and so they have they have, they I you know I'm sure that if you would if you would ask the average Emirati what they think about Jewish self determination, they'd say <laughs> sure. Um, I'm not sure the Palestinians are there yet, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. Do you think that Fatah is uh, is, is is territorialist, or, or is it still as a group um, an existential group? Well, I have to say that um, institutionally, Fatah, Palestinian Authority under Fatah leadership, PLO under Fatah leadership, already going back to 1980, uh, December 88, when Arafat grew very grudgingly with his teeth uh, loudly gnashing, uh, 
uh, did read the text that was dictated to him by the United States uh, administration, the, the last few weeks of the Reagan administration, saying, I recognize the right of Israel to exist, except uh, 242, UN Security Council Resolution 242. All of these were essentially the, the marks of a, a territorialist uh, um, transition. Um, after all, not, not only two for two, but uh, recognizing the uh, partition resolution of 1947, which was done by the National Security, by the National Council of the Palestinian National Council in Algeria, uh, uh, also in uh, in '88. Um, that was essentially accepting the idea of a Jewish state because that's the language of UN Security of uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 181. Having said all this, I would all, I would leave a caveat. First of all, Arafat, under the various guises he wore, was always, I think, in his heart of hearts, closer to the Muslim Brotherhood and thus to, to maybe even Hamas in his uh, deep, in, in his heart of hearts, then to all the socialist verbiage that he learned to uh, uh, declaim uh, during the many years in which he was working with the I Soviets. Agree, but what about Abbas? So, so I'm talking about Arafat and, and Arafat has his own followers and disciples within the Palestinian system today. He also was a um, fundamentally a, um, a fence sitter. He always had one leg here and one leg there. And he played with the territorialist idea, but he also refused to basically let go of the existentialist uh, dream down the road. And people like Sai Barakat, the late Sai Barakat, who ironically died uh, while undertaking treatment in one of the best Israeli hospitals, but Sai Barakat was also ref adamantly refusing to make that final step uh, of recognizing the legitimacy uh, of Israel uh, as, as uh, the embodiment of the, Jew the right of Jews. So um, even within Fatah, there's always been uh, ambiguities. Abu Mazen is an interesting case, um, Mahmoud Abbas, by, or by his nom de guerre, Abu Mazen. Uh, not that he was much of a warrior, he was, he was always an administrator. There's, not in, there's no direct uh, stains, there are no direct stains of blood uh, on his hands, although he was part of the of Fatah and the PLO when they were very active as terrorist organizations. But with Abbas, something very interesting happened, I believe. He was very, he was the, the PLO's man in Moscow. He was very much into the PLO, uh, let's say, membership of the community of the progressive forces that, uh, that were pro-Soviet until the Soviets died on them, I mean, collapsed on them. And the Soviet collapse, he, he, well, he has a PhD, a very notorious PhD, under, underestimating or, or denying parts of the Holocaust. And, uh, accusing the Zionist movement of collaboration with the Nazis is the sort of, uh, of uh, forgive my language, BS that the Soviets uh, were very eager to produce in the 70s and 80s because they were being undermined by Zionism. So Abu Mazen comes from the Soviet connection and then this, the, the drama of Soviet collapse made him face the fact that the international community that they once imagined no longer exists. The, the Palestinians must choose either to ch join the forces that fight against it, like Hamas and Hezbollah and, and, and the Daesh and whoever else, or conform to the norms and expectations of the international community. Uh, namely, the uh, community as led by the United States at the time. And he did cross that river, and he did understand that this would require a, a, a recog in, in, an implicit recognition of the need to uh, accept Israel, work with Israel. Uh, he has sustained uh, under his leadership the security cooperation with Israel, which is the practical uh, uh, reflection of this realization. So uh, while he is not strong enough, never been strong enough, 
to impose his will uh, on, uh, on Palestinian society as a whole. And while his corruption, which uh, Bren uh, mentioned, the corruption and, and the internal weakness of the Palestinian governance uh, has undermined his authority. I think he, he basically uh, is today what you would, you would define as a territorialist, as a man who understands Israel uh, is a reality and allows his most trusted lieutenants like, uh, like Farage, the commander of the uh, security force, to work closely with Israel on preventing existentialists uh, of, of various colors uh, from uh, utilizing uh, the Palestinian Authority territories uh, in the West Bank. Uh, he also understands that er today this is again no longer just about Israel and the Palestinians. The Iranians have taken up the existentialist cause, while the Arabs, uh, most Arab countries, most of his traditional friends in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf have taken up uh, as, as Brent says, the, the idea that Israel is a legitimate and, and useful uh, player in the region. And what we see today, military exercises with Arab countries. This is science fiction, gentlemen, ladies. I mean, um, the Emiratis and the Bahrainis with the American Fifth Fleet and the Israeli Navy in the Red Sea are conducting a joint exercise. Yeah. The Egyptians and the Cypriots and the Greeks and the Israeli Navy uh, with the US Sixth Fleet are uh, uh, conducting a joint exercise in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we are living in a very different world in which yeah, the Palestinians it's, it's have to adjust. 50 years ago, the, the three main non-Arab countries in the Middle East, Iran, Turkey, and Israel, where you know where it was sort of was seen as the foil to the Arabs and we're all together and now of course Turkey and Iran are very much opposed to to Israel and, and arguably um, Erdogan and Turkey is a uh, is an existentialist himself. Um, so when Jordan, it comes to Jerusalem, the question of Jerusalem will liberate when after he uh, returned uh, the Hagia Sophia to the status of a mosque, he openly spoke about yeah. Al-Aqsa being next. Yeah, yeah, as if we are not sovereign in Jerusalem. That was a very dangerous game yeah, he was well, playing. And he's still yeah. playing dangerous games. Yeah, I, I happen to agree. Look, a while ago, John yeah. asked a question. Um, he, he posed a question and he said, uh, what about the idea of a, of a, of a three-state um, resolution instead of a two-state solution? Um, and I, I had to ask him because I wasn't sure if he meant Jordan, Israel, and Palestine or Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. And it turns out he's saying Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. Um, John, the answer to your question is, in, in my book, I go through, I mean, obviously, I talk a lot about the two-state outcome, a negotiated two-state outcome, because that's, that's where everyone's been focused. But these days, people, some people talk about a one-state outcome, they talk about a federated state, they talk about a three-state outcome, and so on and so forth. The problem with all of these ideas, I mean, they all have weaknesses, as, as for that matter, the two-state outcome has a weakness. The problem is, if the existentialists aren't undermined, and if, if the yes, existentialists are brought into the situation, then it will it will fail anyway. So arguably, yes, Hamas, which is existentialist, is in charge of Gaza, and Fatah is tenuously in charge of the West Bank. But also, arguably, Fatah only retains control in the West Bank because the Israeli army is there. And plenty of people would say that if Israel were to withdraw from the West Bank tomorrow, then Fatah would collapsed pretty quickly as they collapsed in Gaza in 2000 and 2007, 2006. Um, so, um, so the problem is any, any such solution, a three-state solution, if the existentialist conflict between Israel and the existentialist and Palestinian society hadn't, hadn't yet been won or hadn't yet been managed, and really it's up to Palestinian society to manage their own existentialists, as it is up to Israeli society to manage their own existentialists, then ultimately the solution um, would, would probably fail in the same way that the two-state peace process failed as well. This is why we are very much now in a conflict management mode, uh, not only because of domestic Israeli political considerations. There's a coalition that stretches from uh, people to the right of Netanyahu um, let's say territorialists, but with a very little to offer territorially, 
uh, all the way to the um, hard Zionist left who would give the Palestinians everything beyond the force of June 67 lines and carve up Jerusalem into two pieces, which very few Israelis would agree to. So in order to sustain a coalition of all these forces, conflict management rather than conflict resolution is the order of the day. But it is also the case because the Palestinians are very deeply divided. The Palestinian Authority is weak and Abbas is in his, uh, the autumn of his days. And uh, there is no prospect right now of uh, the Fatah or the territorialists regaining control of Gaza. So the best we can hope for in, the, in, in Gaza is essentially, uh, again, conflict management, uh, some kind of uh, an arrangement under which they would live their lives and stop uh, pestering our uh, people on the other side of the border. Uh, while we allow them uh, some economic leeway. And the key to the solution in, uh, in this case is not in our hands, it's actually in Egypt. The Egyptians hold the key to uh, uh, the future of the political game in Gaza. Uh, given who Sisi is and who he fought in order to come to power, uh, I believe he abhors the uh, Hamas and the existentialists on the Palestinian side as much as we do, but uh, he has learned to be very patient. And, and this is a long, long game. This is not a short, uh, this is not something that's going to happen in, on any short order. Ultimately, the Egyptians are hoping for some kind of a replication in Gaza of the Tamarud movement, the huge, um, groundswell of opinion against Muhammad Morsi after his, the year of Khalaf Muslim Brotherhood misrule in Egypt, uh, which led ultimately to the replacement of, uh, of, of the Morsi government. I'm not using the four letter word, of course, because that would have some political consequences. But Sisi came to power uh, because uh, among other things, because the mass of Egyptians felt that Morsi was failing. Nothing of the sort has happened in Gaza yet, but uh, this rebellion movement, Tamarud means rebellion, uh, that, that uh, swept Egypt um, in 2013, may yet one day engulf Gaza when uh, the Gazans are sick and tired of, of seeing their life uh, disrupted in the service of, a, of an uh, Islamist uh, fantasy. Look, I'd love to see that, but I, I, um, I'm not going to hold my breath, unfortunately. Um, but Egypt has been True enough. quite interesting um, recently. I mean, the, the changing of, remember Air Sinai is, is this sort of fake airline that only had one destination, which was flying between Egypt and, and Tel Aviv. They now scrapped that, and now suddenly Air Egypt flies to Israel for the first time, even though the peace treaty has been there for 40 years. Um, it, it feels like they're also... Um, they're also just opening up. They seem to be a bit more open about their relationship with Israel. It feels like they've been swept along with the Abraham Accords. There's a peace of mind at the JISS that's coming on, on this very issue of uh, the, the, the small signs. I mean, it's still pretty free, uh, frozen or pretty chilly relationship, but it's thawing at the edges. Um, my um, friend um, Ida Lichter has her hand up. I'm just going to open up the microphone. Um, how are you going? Are you there? Hello. How are you going? Ida, you, you have unmuted. Would you like to ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, barely. All right. All right, that's not working, so we'll, <laughs> we'll just... We'll just skip that. Um, what, um, to, to round us out, it, it is only a few minutes to nine o'clock and we will finish at nine. Um, what do we need to do um, in, order to, in order to create peace? Um, my book, I, I talk about, um, we, we, the grand thing is, is each side, the territorialists on each side have to, um, have to bolster the territorialists on the other side, and they need to undermine the existentialists on their own side. Now, Israel, for instance, um, there are, notwithstanding what, what one thinks about the settlements, um, there are 
um, unofficial settlements that are created in the West Bank by people that call themselves the hilltop youths. They are existentialists. They are doing their best to undermine any chance for Israeli-Palestinian peace. And Israel frequently allows these outposts to remain in existence. And sometimes over time, water is connected to these to these outposts and electricity is connected to the outposts. And ultimately, um, the IDF will protect these outposts from, from Palestinian attack. And what these actions do in my mind is um, they reward the actions of existentialists and thereby build up existentialists. And I think Israel needs to make sure that any existentialist actions um, such as building up these unofficial outposts or the um, price tag um, graffiti and violence that takes place against Palestinian civilians needs to be absolutely cracked down upon. And of course, there's plenty of existentialists on the Palestinian side as well. And the Palestinian territorialists need to, need to crack down on their own existentialists in order for peace to work. But I'd be interested to know, Iran, what you think Israel and the Palestinians can do in order to um, generate a greater possibility of peace. Well, uh, clearly the, uh, there is a problem within the Israeli right wing between people who uh, uh, are, are carried into an existentialist position and people who simply say, when, until the day... Oh. Sorry, Ryan, you've frozen. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're about to um, receive uh, um, good advice regarding what to do with the conflict. But unfortunately, it looks like Iran is frozen there. Um, so I am going to, I might just use this opportunity to, to close off the conversation because it is nine o'clock. Can, um, can I thank Iran? Can I also uh, thank Mark Dreyfus, Jeremy Liebler, for, um, for being a part of this evening, for their words. I also really want to thank my wife, Cecilia. Um, without her support, there is no way that, that this book would have, been, um, would have been written with all the other um, distractions that, that life provides us. Um, so thank you to all. Thank you for all of you for, for coming this evening. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with Iran, who just dropped off the conversation, actually. So I guess his internet really did fail. But, um, but thank you all.